Fidelio is Beethoven's only opera. It's an incredible story of this union between these two people. I'm very, very fortunate to have Lisa Davidson as Leonora. It's going to be a tremendous debut for her. That's a one in a million voice. And as the unjustly imprisoned Florestan, we have Jonas Kaufmann. So I'm very, very honored and happy that we celebrate an opera that is in his native language. A story of liberty, justice, freedom, and yeah, love. The year is 1805, the city is Vienna, and at the Theatre and der Wien, the premiere of a brand new opera, Fidelio, by Beethoven, his only opera. It tells the story of Florestan, the political prisoner, wrongly detained, and his wife, Leonora, who goes undercover in a brave attempt to set him free. Fidelio was not a huge success on its opening night, but that did not deter Beethoven. He spent the next ten years working on the production, turning it into the masterpiece that we know today. Well, this year marks the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. And that's call for a brand new production of Fidelio here at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, directed by Tobias Kratzer. Fidelio has its first night, or first matinee, on Sunday afternoon, March the 1st, and will be shown in cinemas around the world, live from London, on the 17th of March. I'm Petrock Trelawney. Welcome to a very special insight, coming to you live from the Claw studio in the very heart of the Royal Opera House and supported by Rolex. Over the next hour and a quarter or so, we will hear all about this brand new production of Fidelio. We'll meet its producer, its costume designer. We'll look at some of the costumes. We'll hear some of the music from Fidelio with the music director of the Royal Opera House, Sir Antonio Papano. And we'll discuss early reception of the opera and its history as part of the operatic tradition. We begin by meeting four of the very starry cast who will be taking to the stage for the first time on Sunday. Please welcome to join me here Jonas Kaufmann, Lisa Davidson, Amanda Forsyth, and Georg Zeppenfeld. Now, I know you've come straight from rehearsals, and I know you're working very hard at the moment in the final stages of the, the process before Sunday's opening, so thank you very much indeed for, for, for joining us this evening. Let me start by asking each of you to tell us about your role and about your character. Let me start with you, Jonas. Well, uh, I'm playing uh, Florestan, who in this case is actually chained to, uh, to the ground, which is uh, what has become a rarity. Um, it's not uh, the usual, um, but uh, in this case, still, we are in, in different circumstances, but this is something that probably later will be uh, unveiled by the, um, by the team. Uh, in general, of course, I mean, he's been imprisoned uh, for two years at least. Um, he's starving. Uh, he's facing death. He has hallucinations. Uh, that's probably what, what, you, uh, what you can... Uh, rationalize the, the idea of, of, of him singing crazy lines, um, which wouldn't be physically possible for, for such a prisoner. Uh, so I believe it's all in his head. Um, yeah, and uh, ultimately, suddenly, uh, he uh, faces his wife in prison, uh, who is dressed as a man and, uh, and uh, takes on everyone. <laughs> just, just to be clear, he is a political prisoner. He shouldn't, shouldn't be. He's there. a political prisoner. Uh, also, this you see. I mean, yes, that's. It's been said that I've been, I've been put in, in prison because I tried to, to uh, uh, bring down uh, my rival. Um, the question is obviously, uh, who is that rival? In our version, you're going to see later. Um, we, we set it in the French Revolution. So Robespierre is is the, my evil alter ego, uh, but there are many more possibilities to interpret this. Uh, you, can, you can also see Florestan as maybe someone who isn't that innocent, 
um, and, and also has, has built an alliance with others. Um, everything is possible. So, of course, it, he's, he's put in prison for political reasons, whether it's for um, a proper reason or, or whether it's just to, uh, instead of behead him, uh, just <laughs> uh, bury him in, in, the, in the deepest car. So, I don't know. Lisa, what about your character? Yeah, so as you said, I'm the Leonore, who's um, his wife, and um, dresses up and somehow takes his courage, I think, the political um, uh, courage that he has, and, and tries to, to rescue him. First, you actually get to meet Leonore very briefly, and you'll be explained later as well. Uh, and then she dresses up as a man, cuts off her hair, and, um, and goes into this prison as well. I want to work here. I want to get to know these people and I want them to like me so much that I will find my husband and save him. And um, so sure first you've got to be allowed down to the dungeon really to, to prove that, that your husband is actually is actually there. Yeah, so at first this is search for, to find him and, uh, and uh, to, f to find the way to his uh, cell or where, wherever he is. That's, that's of course the first step, but the, or, or the, the step that we see, but um, her first action is to get to know them so that you actually get to, to find the keys and to find a way and to be allowed into this person with all these men. And that's why she then calls herself uh, Fidelio and, and um, is man enough to get a job there. And she is incredibly determined and incredibly brave. Absolutely. I, I have never met someone that brave so that I know. I've read about those women, so I'm trying to to find that bravery within. But it's for, it's for love, but it's something more than that. I think it's something that she has seen from Florestan. I think it's something that they have, something that he has done, and she wants to somehow continue what he searched for in life, in, in the world. He wanted to do what's right, and I, as a wife, wanted to support him in that. And when he couldn't do it, she steps up and says, well, then I will do it for you. And I think that's what's drive her, together with this endless love for him, of course. Amanda, introduce yourself on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I play Marcelina, uh, who is the daughter of the jailer and the only woman in the prison, or so I think. Um, and at the beginning of the opera, I'm ending a relationship with Giacchino, who also works at the prison, because a young man has come into our lives, and uh, <laughs> I only have eyes for him. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Gail. Well, Rocco is uh, the kind of the chief guard of this prison. He's in charge of uh, all the staff that is working there and also of the prisoners. And uh, in addition to this, we uh, get to know him as a loving father of his daughter, Marcelina, and also as a political interested person which is not quite common to the role of Rocco. Normally you always see an elderly man who is struggling through his life and he is, uh, has to get along with very little money and he's always peering at getting a little bit more out of this life for his personal uh, interest. And, uh, but in this production he is a much more colorful person. We also see that he is involved in the political things which are going on in this revolutionary uh, situation um, that makes it much more interesting than in mo most other productions that I know of. Know of. You make a very interesting point because it, it is an opera which <coughs> potentially has so many different sides, doesn't it? Each character has so many different thoughts going on, so many that might be good, might be bad, might be ambiguous. Uh, it, it, it does, Jonas, I think, make it a particularly interesting piece of theatre. Oh, yes, I think so. I mean, it's, it is quite tricky. I mean, the whole opera, I mean, Tony Pavano is going to tell you more about it, probably, <clears throat> that also musically, because we are very close to Mozart, um, so it's not this straightforward uh, um, uh, carpet that you just lay out and, and it just flows on its own. I mean, it's, it's very fragile and there's a many, many uh, uh, hinges and, and, and corners where you, where you have to set... Uh, um, uh, towards the next direction. And it's not only um, uh, musically like that, it's also uh, the play, because you have these dialogues in between, which is, at least nowadays, quite uncommon, um, to combine these uh, uh, musical gems. 
and um, and therefore there's a, there's a lot of space, as you said, in in uh, in interpretation, <clears throat> but it is also quite difficult to to keep the the thing moving mm. and, and going and 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 hold the hold the tension um, up. So um, it is, uh, I think, for all of us. I mean, I, I have to actually exclude myself because in this production I'm not talking. Um, <laughs> So uh, I can only listen to the others, but uh, um, nevertheless, it is uh, it is quite challenging in, in many ways. This this is your this is your first first time singing this role. Yes, it is. <laughs> How easy is it to approach as a performer? I would not start with easy. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I think he's completely right. It's it's very um, naked in a way, and it's technically. Uh, difficult in in for me what's complete in new ways I, I have spent like hours and hours on, on on the same phrases whereas other times you can use the same amount of time actually you learning the music this is it's fairly easy to to learn because it's the way it's written but then to get it get it technically in and to to find the way you want to phrase it you think you have one and then uh, Babano has uh, 10 other options and then there's, uh, you meet your colleagues and then suddenly you get new in inspiration and, and that's why it's fun and that's why it's lovely but it's also why I, um, I've spent a lot of time to, to find the right way of, of, of doing it and also to find the right stamina in, in it and, and to, to, to build it properly. Um, but it's, um, it's an interesting work as well. Amanda, I mean, we, we, we think of Beethoven as a great symphonist, as a writer of sonatas, as a writer of quartets, and then just this one opera, his one go at writing for the operatic, the operatic voice. Do you, do you regret there aren't more? Well, I wouldn't be the first person to say that Beethoven didn't really know how to write well for the voice. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful music to listen to, but it's really difficult to sing. Um, things that, that should just sail out, you have to prepare, like Lisa said, for a really long time. Um, so in that sense, uh, I'm not sure, maybe he would have gained more technique, more skill in mm. writing for the voice if he had written more operas. Um, there's certainly songs and other, other big works, other big choral works. Yeah, but imagine the time, excuse me, that it, that it took him to, to finally say, okay, this is it. I mean, the, the three attempts to premiere this piece uh, with all its its changes and everything uh, it, it was impossible mm. to write yet another one it, it, no matter whether it was a failure or a success uh, he was always in doubt with himself it, whatever he did he questioned it he did a lot of of uh, sketches and and then threw them away and and tried it another time he wasn't just writing uh, it, it didn't flow out of him like nothing and uh, and I think this uh, uh, it it wouldn't just physically be possible for him to do another opera. But uh, if I may say one word about about the, what Amanda just said uh, about how difficult it is and how odd it seems that such a great talent doesn't know doesn't seem to know how to write easily for voices. Um, I always thought that like, like that. And of course, whatever you do, whether the songs are. Okay, but, but if you think of Ninth Symphony, or last set, or if you think of Mrs. Solemnis, for instance, there are so many very difficult uh, bits in it, and also for the, for the chorus to sing. It's, it's almost impossible to, to imagine a chorus at that time, um, non-professional, would have been able to actually sing it's it. It's a really interesting point, that, isn't it? This wouldn't but have been a full-time chorus I as we think, use today. I think it was for a reason. So, the effort that it took him, the struggle that he had, this this burden, this it, it was so difficult, and 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 I think this difficulty he wanted to hear also in in the music, it was for him an um, a symbol of of uh, of the struggling humanity, let's say, and uh, and if someone is is in trouble, why should he sound beautiful? Mm. So this is something we now ha have have to face when we sing. Um, composers who brilliantly wrote for voices, sometimes it's just, why is it so beautiful? I mean, he's, he's in pain, and still he's singing the, the, the most relaxed lines. <laughs> On contrary, there we should actually add a little bit of this 
of this craziness uh, of Beethoven in order to make it more realistic. Gerg, say a little bit more about that relating to this very interesting character of, of, of Rocco. We've talked about the technical difficulties, but what about the emotional difficulties and conveying the emotional range of, of, of your character? Yeah, it is, uh, many things, as I mentioned before, come together in this character. And this is also be found in the music. You find him singing a very simple sounding aria about the, the, the values of being wealthy, of having gold. It sounds like, like, very, um, like a simple song, like a tune that you, that you can, can find anywhere in, in, on, the, on the streets. And in the next moment, you find out there are very expressive phrases where it, it really it is about expression. And as I, I, would, I would like to add to what, what Jonas said, that um, Beethoven is somewhere in between. He has begun write, to write really expressive music which leads to Weber, leads to Wagner. And on the other hand, he's still stuck in, uh, in a tradition and in, in an idea of how to write a four-part ensemble. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you work on these ensembles and you find out you're singing the same phrase four times and you do it four times differently, and it, you find out it is not by occasion. It has a reason in the, in the setting of the four voices singing together how the links are, are leading from one voice to, to the other one. So uh, it, it really, it, you have to be very much aware of what the details of this music are, because they are links to, uh, to this, this classicism that Beethoven still is stuck in, which Wagner later has put away completely. Um, but these are the two main uh, points in, in between we find Beethoven. He's fighting himself from one to the other, and that makes it interesting musically, and it relates to the character. It's a very interesting thought to have as well as we, as we watch the opera. Lisa, last question to you before we, we let you go. Just give us an update on the, the process of rehearsals. Are you, are you on schedule? Are you terribly behind? Where, where are you up to? We're right on time, no. <laughs> oh, turn no, off the camera. Had, uh, piano <laughs> run today, so uh, that was nice to get the, the full run course with the with with just a piano but um, it's always nice to get to get um, get to do those runs because then you also see where, where it needs this last uh, fixing things either either musically or, or technically on stage and, and everything but I I look forward to Sunday and um, and I, I I'm glad we have some more days but but I I, <laughs> I think it's uh, we'll be there right yeah. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed for, for joining us. After, as I said, a, a long day of rehearsal, enjoy your evenings and uh, get Thank some rest before rehearsals start again first thing uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much, Jonas Kaufman, uh, Lisa Davidson, Amanda Forsyth and Georg Zeppenfeld. Thank you. Right. I think we're getting a sense of how eagerly awaited this new production of Fidelio here at the Royal Opera House is. An opening night, an opening matinee on Sunday, and then March the 17th, that date for your diary, when Fidelio will be in a cinema near you, pretty much wherever you're joining us from in the world this evening. Let us know where you are watching tonight, actually. You can comment on our YouTube page. Let us know, too, any questions you have for later on this evening, when we'll be joined by the artistic team behind Fidelio. Right now, let's talk a bit about the history of the opera and the context of the opera. I'm delighted to welcome to the Claw Studio and to this evening's live insight the music historian and writer Katie Hamilton. <laughs> well, there's lots to talk about in the story <laughs> of, of Fidelio, isn't there? Uh, this wasn't going to be his first opera. He started off writing something else. He did, and he was obviously interested in the idea of writing operas right from the beginning of the 1800s. But he was approached by Emmanuel Schikaneder, who, of course, we associate with Mozart, with the magic flute, with a libretto for an opera called Vesta's Feuer that Schikaneder wanted to put on at the Theater an der Wien. And he'd started to um, produce the opera, and he decided that, actually, he didn't think the libretto was good enough. 
Um, he'd already written some insert operas for somebody else's opera when he'd first arrived from Bonn to Vienna for Josef Umlauf, who ended up conducting one of the first performances of Fidelio. So Beethoven knew his operatic repertoire. He was kind of moving around in the operatic world and testing the waters. What he was so determined to find and why he eventually threw over the Schikaneda was a libretto that he really wanted to set. And actually, he writes to friends that whilst he thinks Mozart is the most superb opera composer, he wouldn't set some of the libretti that Mozart had set because he wants something that's kind of noble and morally upstanding for his opera. And of course, he finds it with Fidelio. Did he like the opera? I mean, was he an opera fan? Would he have been at, at Mozart operas? Would he have been a regular visitor to the Theatre and Devine? Was it an art form that excited him? He does seem to have gone to opera, certainly. And he was also involved in rehearsing um, operas when he was still in Bonn. So he was kind of actively engaged with it. He was very, very admiring of Cherubini, who he met in 1805 um, and spent some time um, talking to Carabini about what a, an eminent composer he considered him to be and what an important art form opera was in France. He's really interested in what's going on in France. And of course, that's where he, he writes repeatedly about French libretti being the most interesting libretti. That's where the good texts are coming from. Not Germany, in fact, and not even Italy either. So tell us about this libretti that he, he chooses. So he finds um, this story by Jean-Nicolas Bouy, which had been written at the end of the 18th century. It had already been set in France um, as an opera by Pierre Caveau, who actually played Florestan in the first performance in 1798. And Beethoven encounters it probably in about 1803, which is at the same point when he tells Shekhaneda he's had done with Vesta's foyer. So we don't quite know whether he actually had done with Vesta's foyer or he found the story of Leonora and thought, actually, that's a better bet. Um, he's very uh, interested in trying to work it into something dramatically exciting, and he knows that that's possible because there's already been a performance of Ferdinando Paia's setting, operatic setting, of the same story in Vienna in Italian. That happens 1803-1804, um, by which point Beethoven's making his sketches. So he finally gets his first version ready for 1805, um, and he ends up calling it Fidelio because he can't call it Leonora because the other opera is called Leonora, and the, you know we don't want kind of you know copyright infringement of titles. So he's told that he must call it Fidelio instead, and that's why it has the different name for its first performance. Does he he take that libretto and set it absolutely faithfully? Does he make lots of changes to it? No, he works with um, Josef von Zonleitner, who was working with with Vienna court opera houses um, to put together a libretto to translate it, of course, because it's a French text. Um, and Zonleitner adds certain bits and restructures it. And then for each of the subsequent versions, up to version number three in 1814, the final version of Fidelio as stands, he works with a different partner on the text each time through. So he works in 1805, 1806 with his friend, Stefan von Breuning. And then finally, he gets in um, Georg Friedrich Treitschke, who is a much more experienced stage man who is then able to kind of tidy up the state that it's in to make it a dramatically satisfying whole. Tell us about the first night in, in 1805. Well, it's a disaster because about a week before uh, he finally gets the thing on the stage, Napoleon invades Vienna. Um, which is not brilliant for kind of selling tickets. So mostly the opera house is full of French soldiers who can't understand what's happening because it's all in German and, you know, don't really think very much of what they're seeing in any case. Um, the critical reviews are not good. They say that there's some nice music, there's some beautiful music, but it's too repetitive, it's not well structured, it's still in three acts at that point, it doesn't really have very much in the way of dramatic tautness. So he pulls it after three nights and goes away and beavers away at it again with Stefan von Breining to kind of tidy it up. So he makes a very conscious too. decision, this, this isn't doing me any good, no. get it off and start And start, and start, and yeah, start and, and try and fix it. And then he has another go in 1806, March, April time, he gets a few performances. These are both at Theater and der Wien. Schikaneda's left, so there's a new intendant by this point. And it seems to go okay, actually, in March, April, um, these two performances in 1806. Seems to be quite well received. But something happens. We don't know exactly what it was. It may have been an argument about royalties and rights that were being shared between Beethoven and the house. But he, he marches in after the second night, he takes the score and leaves. So they can't do it again. 
because they haven't got the dots anymore. And then he sort of parks it, and it's only a number of years later when he's approached by a group of three musicians um, from a different opera house who say, we want to put this on as a benefit performance, and this is for 1814, you know, please will you let us, that he says, yes, provided you give me the time to actually fix the things that need fixing. And now he rolls up his sleeves again, he approaches Treitschke, he gets the libretto fixed for a third time, and that's the very successful version that then hits the stage in 1814. And within his his life does he get the success of the piece does he does he realize that he has created a, a masterpiece he, he certainly does get major success and the kind of the kind of crowning achievement for 1814 because again politically it's landed very neatly in 1814 by this point Napoleon's just been defeated so we've gone from Napoleon has invaded Vienna and ruined the first night the first time around to Napoleon has been defeated sort of two or three weeks before the first night the third time around so of course it's perfect mm. perfect timing um, but also Fidelio is then performed um, on the opening gala night of the Congress of Vienna, the great Congress that sort of redrew the map of Europe after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which is all about galas and parties and special performances, and Beethoven's opera is there in the place of honour at the beginning. So he certainly, you know, achieved what he set out to do by winning acclaim for the piece. I'm going to ask you to stay with us, and we'll talk more in about half an hour about other aspects of, of Fidelio and its reception. Katie Hamilton, for now, thank you very much indeed. We've heard... <laughs> We've heard from Jonas and uh, from Lisa and Amanda and Georg about the musical complexity of this opera. Let's have a bit of analysis now of the music. Uh, very pleased that for the next half an hour during this live insight, we're going to have a, 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 an introduction to the score from the man who's going to conduct on Sunday afternoon, the music director of the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, Sir Antonio Papano, and he is joined by the pianist, Edmund Whitehead. Please welcome Antonio Papano and Edmund Whitehead. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I was listening to what um, Jonas and Lisa were saying about <coughs> singing this music. And from my perspective, it's been a very interesting process. I've done the opera a couple of times. But when you listen to the opera, you, the, the harmonies are familiar. You, you feel comfortable listening to this music, and everything fits beautifully together. But that's an illusion. <laughs> I say that because to achieve this... Um, dance, if you like, between the orchestra and the singers takes quite some doing. The Beethoven's set up a situation where, in most cases, the singers, the soloists, are treated as really part of the orchestra fabric. So when you're rehearsing this music, the, the singers at first feel like they're in a straitjacket. It's very, it's very unusual. It's, it's as if Beethoven is the puppet master, that, that, that the idea of divadom or the idea that a singer would go outside the lines was anathema to him. And this is a person, and it's already been said tonight, that the, 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 um, the frivolity of and the sexual politics of Mozart's operas and the divas that went along and write me that aria and write me this aria and you know oh no that that person has more eyes that that was not for him he his cause was much more elevated more noble um, and so together we work to first of all come together to fit in to this wonderful tapestry and then what I've been doing over the last four weeks is screaming at everybody to be individual. Now, how do you make somebody individual when they're supposed to, they're very much part of a, a pattern? Well, you have a part of a, a pattern of, of, of instruments, of instrumentalization, of, of, uh, music, of chamber music, basically. Well, we have the theater, we have the voice, we have the words. And with those elements, 
you find ways using the language, the consonants, the vowels, the length of the notes. This has to be, if, if this is short, then the next bit has to be long in contrast, or vice versa. Always changing the articulation, the, the way you say something, the way you explain something. And German is a fantastic language for that um, because certain words uh, have long vowels and certain words have very, very short vowels. Now, this ma makes the music jump off the page if you are faithful to that idea that you're bringing the language to life. And it's a very, very... I, I'm, t I'm talking shop here very much, but it, it's actually fascinating because, of course, I want my singers, I certainly want them to be together with the orchestra, that for sure. Um, uh, but, uh, and to achieve that is already hard enough, as I've explained. But I need them to be part of a bigger drama. I need them, I need Leonora to be Leonora. I need Marcelina to be Marcelina, Rocco, Rocco, etc., Floristan and Pizarro, and these characters are actually very, very interesting. And though those, there's very little that happens uh, dramatically on stage, their thoughts, their motivations are always, ex are very, very clearly expressed. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Because Beethoven is thinking, he's, he's, you can feel very much that he's dreaming along with these characters. I sense it every day, I, I, I can't believe it. Now, of course, for something you've talked about, you know, how complex, how difficult, how important this piece is. Well, it's important also because of the level of, of effort and trial and error and perseverance that it took to get the thing into this version, a dramatically viable version a beautiful metaphor also for the perseverance of the main character of Leonora. This, well, this opera, I find it's, it's almost a testament to, to, to woman. It's, a, it's feminist in a way. It's a celebration of not only her, her womanhood, but her, her strength of character, her perseverance, as I said, her trust all the while praying to God and praying to the idea of, of hope that what she believes is actually, is actually true. It's so touching. It's, it's incredible. But the opera starts as if it were the lightest of operettas and uh, using musical cells, which Beethoven is famous for. He use, well, the most obvious, da, 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 that's a cell. It's a musical cell that he will take and develop and create a, an organism that is beyond mind-blowing. Well, this, this cell is perhaps not as momentous, but the, the scene that, that opens the opera is two characters bickering. You have the amorous Giacchino and the, um, the go away, I don't have time for you now, um, Marcelina. And um, the, the, the cell is this, it's very simple. Dum becomes impatient. Dum dum da. He keeps daring to to become almost aggressive. When somebody is amorous, you could look at it two ways. When somebody is amorous, it must go too far. Or the irritation of Marcelina. It's beautifully crafted in this way. And in a few notes, you're in. Now you'll hear throughout um, the way he uses uh, the orchestra. You hear the bickering. Listen, listen, go. Now, he warms up a little bit and he becomes, oh, come on, go. You see what I meant by long and short? By using the short notes, you get this, you get this activity, you get this nervosity, which is good for a first number in opera. And then he contrasts it with legato. He's trying to be, and she she answers with. See how she answers. 
Now, you just heard him do an accent. Each number, as it goes along, as the opera goes along, becomes more and more accented. To write the kind of accents that he wanted, he wrote SFP a lot of time, which means sforzando piano, which means hitting a note and releasing quickly. In this duet, it's hugely important because otherwise the orchestra completely drowns out the singers. If they go, pa, then the singers can't pass through. But pum, and the singers can, can, can get through. To write that out the hundreds of times, thousands of times in this score, is something that, that is incredible to me every, uh, when I look. Because it, the effort to make sure, to try to make sure that the orchestra is active, yes, but still letting the singers need, uh, let the singers pass through and be communicative of, of what they want to say, what they're thinking, etc. Now, I've given you an idea of the kind of bickery type of music, but listen to this. This contrast is incredible because we find out there, she doesn't want to know uh, um, anything about his amorous advances, but, and she kind of almost sends him away, but then you, you have a moment where she, she, you find out why. It's because she's, she's captivated by Fidelio, this, this young man who has come to the prison. And see how the music changes. She says his name. An almost Mozartian grace. And then you hear the you hear where Beethoven comes from, no? From Haydn and Mozart. And it's very, very clear in this. And it's but dramaturgically, it's not decorative. It's dramatic. Because it's not, it's not how pretty I can sing. And Amanda sings it very beautifully, by the way. But, but it's, it's, it's an oasis for the character to show the audience what's really going on here. And it's fantastically clever. And just by the very simple, the simplest of means. Now we go to the second number. And this use of little motives and imitation you heard all coming from all over the orchestra. But here it's, it's a closer range. Listen, where it's an aria where she says, oh, if only I could be joined with, uh, together with him and, and call him my husband. It's, it's a, like, oh, if only. And you hear this. It, I don't know how he got it, but you hear if only. Listen, one, two. <laughs> See the little imitations. And again, dum dum is oh it on if only. That's the German version of if only. Dum dum. Okay, and um, and we get we get then of the first time this word Hoffnung, hope, comes up. It's a wonderful thing because the, the, the aria starts in C minor. It's the key of the Pathetic Sonata and, and, and the Fifth Symphony. And, but um, hope is already filling uh, my breast um, with unspeakable sweet joy. And uh, it's almost feverish, this music. If you can play just before, yeah. There's a funny note uh, that, yeah, she, play. It's another. Yeah, play. That's me, that's the orchestra. And she has this beautiful melody. Um, oh, I f it, it, it must go this way, I hope, I hope. And together, the energy that's created by these, by, by me having these little figures, these little motifs, these little imitations, if you like, and her, um, yeah, uh, 
unspeakable and sweet joy comes, comes through in, in the most beautiful, beautiful way. Now, I've spoken about two numbers that are mainly, mainly having to do with short notes. We've heard da 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 dum We've heard dum 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 ding dum And dim da di da di da 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 Or quicker tempi. But now, number three, the quartet, where all the singers, the, the four singers are expressing all different things. Marcelina says, Mir ist so wunderbar, es engt das Herz mir ein. It's, it's so... It's so wonderful. My, my, my heart is... You understand? Um, <laughs> he, he loves me. It's clear. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy. And Leonora says, my God, the danger is... is it, it's so dangerous here. You know, she's in disguise. This girl's in love with her. Um, and, uh, and how... The word it comes again, Hoffnung. How hope seems so dim at this moment. Uh, the father overlooks that, that, looks over them and says, oh, it's clear she loves him. It's, it's obvious. Um, and it, the, the sort of prospective happy father-in-law. And then you have Giacchino, who kind of sees Marcellina completely taken with, with Fidelio. And his words are, mir streibt sich schon das Haar. And he's going absolutely crazy. And it's, it's set in a canon. But let me go back to those short notes that I told you about. I said, da 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 dum, and I had dum dum, those first two numbers. But now, all of a sudden, Everybody's thinking. Nobody's talking to, to one another. It's the low strings. And there's a most wonderful sigh here with on this chord. can't tell you the effect of that in the theatre because all of a sudden we have instruments, those the strings playing long, eternally long notes and I, it really takes your breath away and that's before even the singers start to sing and when they sing then each expressing, expressing their own emotion, happy, <laughs> scared, paranoid even, angry, uh, con uh, sort of self-satisfied and the possibility, the hope of, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful, um, from Marcelina, in canon form, each one having their say, but then embroidered as, while the other one is, is singing their tune, then the other one embroiders their part, and it's beautiful. The art of variation was perfected uh, by Beethoven. Here, it's in, in, its, uh, in its glory uh, here, a wonderful, wonderful number. Then there's the number uh, about the, the, the gold that Georg spoke about earlier, um, if you play just a couple of notes, it's a, it's a kind of a tune. And one, la 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 ra di la di ra di ra di ra di. You see how how a tum 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 ti ta ti ra ti ra ra di di. Always contrasting, always making the character individual from short. Long, so that the audience is not da 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 da, because actually a tune is not so fantastic, <laughs> when when truth be told. But when it has the right articulation, dum dum dum, he's a simple man. La da di da di da da, with money anything's possible, you know. He says. The spectacular trio follows this, and. It, it, it's, a, it's an amazing ensemble, perhaps the most difficult number in the whole piece because of its absolute mechanical uh, the, 
precision. I mean, you look at it, it's perfect on the page to realize it on the stage and for everybody to do what they're supposed to do and to act it out is very, very difficult because it feels like it's part of an oratorio. Everybody's all over the place singing in thirds um, together, high skips, uh, and, and to stay dramaturgical, God, we've worked so hard on this number and it's always a challenge, but it, it, but it is absolutely fantastic. And there's a couple of oases in this number, again, where Leonora, in a side, she says, oh, how long must I be prey to, to sorrow and cares? And she says, you hope, du Hoffnung, to give, me, give me consolation, give me, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a balm, save me from, from all this. And the music changes, it's, it's quite, it, it, the music is, starts almost like an, uh, it feels very light and operatic somehow. The characters are simple people, but listen to this, how it changes. It goes into the minor. And, go ahead. Very long, yeah. <laughs> She says, Du hof nun reis mir labum, mir labum. Just for that moment, we enter into her story. We come out of, of this very, very compact trio, and all of a sudden the music becomes, for lack of a better word, it becomes, it, it becomes really deeply human. And we, we, we feel comp the compassion for her that we need to feel to follow the story. Now, of course, every opera has to have a bad guy. And the bad guy in this case is uh, Pizarro. It's very interestingly staged because in this production, um, Pizarro, the delivery of his uh, text, his spoken text, very subtle. He's almost, um, well, uh, uh, Tobias Kratz has almost said, uh, it's almost like a Robespierre character, obviously well-educated, has class, has, and that makes him even more dangerous, of course. And what, what, what is very important is his number, when, um, because he reads a letter, he gets a letter, and the letter warns him that the minister is going to come and check out, he's, that there are rumors about, about prisoners uh, being held unjustly in this prison, and, of course, he's afraid of losing his position. And, and he says, I've got to act now. I've got to, I've got to kill Floristan now. Um, and so his aria is of a rare aggression. But that's in contrast to this very urbane text, which is it's deadly, uh, but very urbane. Almost Scarpia-like. Uh, taste to it and I love that because it offers the maximum contrast. His music starts with the most improbable dissonance. There starts in the bass and you hear this. It's quite, quite ugly. It's in passing, but it you feel the bile and you feel and you feel the the twisted nature of his personality. Listen to this. And Now listen to the accent. Now the accents come fast and furious. Now you've had um, a more gentle type of music. Now everything changes. And it's extraordinary uh, the amount of power the singer needs to, to come across the orchestra here. And yet, uh, and my job to keep the orchestra exciting and vehement uh, and ac accentuated to the maximum without, without covering the singer completely. Um, it's, it's a challenge, and the next number is, for the same reasons, challenging, but the next number is also based on accents. Listen. Yum. It's where Pizarro says to, to Rocco, you're going to help me. We're going to get this job done, and we're going to get it done now. Jetzt, alter old man. Um, and he says, I'm going to pay you well, don't worry. 
and you hear the twitching of Rocco. Ta -da. Yeah, play that again. Play it a little bit slower. One. Yeah, and you and you you feel it's incredible. Like I said before, nothing ha really happens, but just little sentences, little phrases provoke little musical answers that are, make this opera, I think, fascinating. Um, Leonora overhears some of this plotting and planning and she sings an aria. Um, she calls, her first word is abscheulich. I mean, rascal, monster, horrible person, she names him. And listen to the, listen to the, again, through imitation uh, of the instruments and through a complex web uh, um, is created a tumult of, of bile and anger and um, need for revenge. But one, two, three. <laughs> spectacular here is the accents don't fall on the one or the three, the strong parts of the bar, but on the two and the four. Do it again. One, two, um. um. Listen, one, two, three, four. Um, um. You monster. Um. Da, 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 Bang. Um. Da, 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 um. She says, where is this mitla? Where is the call of compassion in you? She's talking about Pizarro here. The, the, the voice of a human being. This menschheit stim. in dein and And she calls his sensibilities. She calls his personality tigress, like a tiger. Tiger zin. says, I feel waves of anger. But then she says also, and we talked about light. Listen, this is one of the great phrases. It goes into C major, and she talks about a rainbow. She says, a rainbow that will offer light to my darkness. She, that's the hope that it, it turns and and that that music that change from D major bang the root no the the other one bang <laughs> to s that phrase I I I pay millions for that phrase if I wrote that um, but anyway she it, that leads to the aria proper where she talks about. Again, Hoffnung. She says, come, hope. And she says, don't let the last star of the weary dim. It's a very poetic idea. And it's here, um, Beethoven, I mean, throughout, we've heard, um, and I haven't spoken about it much, we've heard an incredible virtuosity of the woodwinds, and each, each number has um, its own... Uh, instrumental color, if you like, but this is very particular for the most noble moment where where she said she this is her last prayer before she must act. Um, we have three horns Usu most of the opera is written for two horns, four in the overture but 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 and two through the rock, but this one has three horns, and we get this beautiful prayer. Can you play some of that Ed? Another one. Then all three. Sometimes with the bassoon together. And she says, Just play. It doesn't matter what the words are. Play. Sublime, 
and it's a moment of where we've, we're alone with her. We haven't been alone with her once yet. And that's, that's a moment that's oh, just fantastic. Um, the aria is seemingly impossible to sing, except this gal can sing it, actually, <laughs> uh, um, uh, really, 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 really well. <laughs> and um, uh, the second part is, you know, I'm going to follow the, in my inner engine, if you like. I'm not going to give in. And the music changes. All three horns, that. She talks about the, her uh, Gattenliebe, which is the uh, ma um, married love. And uh, th th this opera is a celebration of that. The, 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 I mean, today one would think such an idea is, is corny, actually, but the, the degree to which she loves her husband, the, which, the degree that the, the bond with him is strong, is just absolutely fantastic and genuine. This from a guy, Ludwig, who never got the girl. <laughs> it's true. And this is very, very important. He's celebrating the idea, sort of a, a utopian idea of what marriage could be. I think that's just absolutely beautiful. Um, after her number, there's uh, yet another extraordinary number, and that's the Prisoner's Chorus. And the Prisoner's Chorus, um, they say, oh, what joy to be released, to be able to, to take the breath, to take a breath. And the pathos of that is um, already in itself uh, is, is very, very strong. Of course, today, with so many people incarcerated and so, so much on television we see, of course, I, I don't think this opera, the, the, the scenes of the, uh, these scenes, or this scene in particular, will never be outdated somehow. There's, there's always, uh, there are always people, um, political prisoners. You know, um, do you know that this opera is not allowed to be performed in China? It's true. Mm. You can imagine the, the prisoners, and as the music gets higher and higher, you imagine the light. They've been in it's the high strings, and they go even higher, and even higher. I don't know, I, I, I'm not very good at singing four-part harmony, but, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, the chorus does, oh, so then they overlap, oh, another one, them taking the breath oh what joy yeah yeah that's very 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 good it, that after the vehemence the, and positive vehemence of Leonora's aria I, I tell you it, it, it's it's a sequence in opera that is absolutely magical I, um, we, the, the opera then um, continues with the re-entry of Pizarro and we get more aggression because he's angry that the prisoners have been released and he screams and shouts and then the prisoners have to go back in. And, um, but the important thing is that Rocco has agreed to let um, Leonora go down with him into the vault, into the, to the, ver the lowest dungeons, where she believes that maybe her husband 
is incarcerated. And I love this moment because um, he says we can, we can go today. And her reaction, he says, I'll, I'll sell it to the governor and saying, because, you know, there's going to be a wedding and, um, and he'll, uh, I'll tell him about you and Marcelina and you're going to get married and, and uh, you know, I'm getting old and I need help to go down there and um, he'll, he'll buy it. You know, and he says, um, I'll not hide uh, the last phrase. Yeah. Noch heute, I know it's my time to stop, but that's <laughs> ridiculous. But Noch heute führ ich in den Kerke dich hinab. I'll bring you down to the dungeon. Dich hinab. Bam, noch heute, today. She says, today. And now. Oh, what joy! Dun, dun, da, 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 da. And this character who has has sung who has sung this be these beautiful prayers, and who's sometimes you know been in the in the clutches of, of danger, of paranoia, with everything around her, and you see her actually happy. It's fantastic. It's 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 it, it's a it's a wonderful moment. I'll just um, stop. I have to say something about the beginning of Act Two because the, the beginning of Act Two was, is probably the most influential piece of music probably ever written. Why? P at least for opera, because it, it's a music that is so completely different than what's come before it that it sets up the whole idea of creating a universe in the different acts. Now, Wagner would take this and run with it, usually in his third act. The third act of every opera he ever wrote becomes something that is so unexpected, so unexpectedly dark, unexpectedly visionary, unexpectedly dramatic. You name, you name it, Meistersinger, Tristan, all those, uh, and, 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 all the, and the Ring operas, all of them. And the color of this beginning, the, the picture of this dungeon, and more, more importantly, the struggles of this human being who has been down there in solitary for two years. And you almost hear this silent scream from the winds. Again. And you can hear his breath, the effort of... The frustration. Uh, which then... And then you hear this like, extraordinary figure. Again, I refer to Wagner because Wagner in the Valkyrie takes this figure and uses it, the disillusionment of Wotan, well, the disillusionment of, of Floristan. One, listen to this. That it almost turns your, your belly up, inside out. It, do it again, one. The most painful. But listen to that, you have, that's very melodic. But listen to this. He talks about, later in the aria, grauenvolle Stille. Uh, horrible silence, isn't it? And then the different rhythms. Piano to the extreme. Now listen to the ta 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 ya ta 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 ta. You have threes and then fours. And listen to this melody here. All in syncopation. I'm not going to make you suffer anymore because it's, it's, too, it's just too beautiful and too horrible at the same time.
But you see how from the operetta elements to the oases of thought and hope to total aggression, to nobility, to resolve, to the, the, pris to the prisoners. You've got all these colors, but you haven't had this. It's extraordinary. And it opens the door to something, to a panorama that is completely different. Um, yes, that's all my time. So act two is for another, is for another time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ed, thank you. Ed. Well, what a fantastic uh, introduction to Act One of Fidelio and the beginning of Act Two from the music director of the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, Sir Antonio Papano. And thank you very much to uh, Edmund Whitehead, one of the wonderful repetiteurs here at Covent Garden who work uh, with the singers as the opera takes shape in the rehearsal room. Katie is still with me. Katie Hamilton, musicologist, writer, academic. So many interesting things there. I want to ask you first about that idea of Fidelio as a feminist opera uh, uh, and whether or not that's something Beethoven would have actually conceived. I'm not sure whether he would necessarily have phrased it in those terms, but it's, <laughs> it's interesting to note that um, when, the, when the first production was put forward in 1805, um, about a month before the first night, the censors put a halt to the opera and said it could not be staged. Um, I mean, you know, Tony was talking about political prisoners and the, the constant um, newness of that idea. They absolutely were living at a time when people were being arrested and they were being put in solitary confinement in castles for years. Without um, human it, rights lawyers. Without, to, to without anything to, to kind of support them. And, you know, with all the little dukedoms and electorates and so on, there were many different situations in which one could find oneself on the wrong side of the law. Um, in 1795, the Austrian censorship laws changed, and the whole paragraph was inserted about the fact that the word Freiheit, freedom, was not allowed to be included in a stage work unless it referred to somebody getting out of prison. So it couldn't be a political concept, but it could be a literal one of getting out of prison. And there are a huge number of plays and operas written at the end of the 18th century that are about prisons, because freedom then becomes a concept that, of course, we all know is political, but is being framed in a dramatically sort of satisfying way. When the censors had a go at Fidelio and said, we can't hold it, Son Leitner got back to them, the librettist, and said, there are five good reasons why you absolutely should let this go ahead. The first is that the Empress is, loves the story. The second is that we're going to perform it on the Emperor's name day, so it's basically an imperial event and you've got to let it go ahead. Um, the third is that you've already let Fernand Ferdinando Paia stage an Italian version of the same story, which is a fairly devastating kind of blow against the case. But then the other two are about the, the plot, and he says, it's set in the 16th century, which means it can't possibly have anything to do with now. Well, I mean, that's the <laughs> trick most French grand operas then play for the next 30, 40 years. And the last point is, he says, the libretto's too good. He says, on the one hand, you must remember that Pizarro is acting in the way that he is for personal and not state reasons. In other words, this is not an action of the state against an individual. This is a personal vendetta, which means it can't be seen as being a reflection on the government. And on the other hand, it's about wifely virtue, and that makes it an excellent libretto. And for moral reasons, therefore, it should be allowed to stand, because weibliche Tugend, wifely virtuousness, is something that we should be promoting on the stages. And he got away with it, and they were able to stage it. How interesting. Uh, the other word that Tony used which, which struck me was utopian, and I suppose that, that is kind of there with Beethoven, isn't it? This idea of, of, of music having a greater value than simply being about entertainment or about uh, uh, pleasure. It is, and it's something that differentiates the, the Beethoven version of the, of the story from the Gavo, the Bui original, is that he's made the characters more noble, actually. He's kind of made them more morally upstanding. And um, one could say that that means, and it's very interesting, the language that, the, that all of our performers this evening have used around this opera as being, you know, hard work but worth it, hard work but ambiguity, hard work but, you know, you, if you get into it, if you kind of chew your way through it, there's so much to be gained from it. 
the, the negative criticisms of the later versions of the Beethoven say that actually he's got so fixated on the idea of the prisoners standing for humanity, the various characters standing as symbols of goodness, that we've actually lost their individual identities, which is why it's really interesting to hear Tony saying it's about making these individual roles people again, mm. and that it's something that the director, that the producer, that the musical team, that the actors have to bring into the mix um, to realise it. Beethoven's not a natural theatre man in the sense that he doesn't have that experience. Can I just ask you one mm. very brief question? We heard from uh, Tony about the influence of Mozart on Beethoven and Beethoven on Wagner. Wagner claimed to see Fidelio, but did he? Yes, so Beethoven, uh, Wagner writes in his autobiography that he is inspired as a young man living in Leipzig to go into opera because he sees the great Wilhelmina Schröder d'Evrient, whom Beethoven saw and hugely admired as, as playing Leonora in 1822, she took over the role. Um, that, that Wagner saw this production with Wilhelmina Schröder d'Evrient playing Leonora in Leipzig when he was a teenager, and that was the thing that got him into opera. It, it never happened. There was no performance of Fidelio <laughs> starring Wilhelmina Schröder d'Evrient. Um, but Wagner, as so often, is so good at just tweaking the old autobiographical details yeah. to set himself up as the Beethovenian successor. Don't let the truth get in the way of <laughs> exactly. a good story. Exactly. Katie, really, really interesting stuff. Thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, here at the Royal Opera House this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Wherever you're joining us from this evening, you're very welcome. We're live to the world on YouTube from the Claw Studio, right at the heart of the Royal Opera House here in Covent Garden, where the new production of Fidelio will open on Sunday afternoon, live to cinemas around the world on the 17th of March. Uh, we have viewers this evening in Germany, France, Argentina, Mexico, Sweden and Brazil, as well as at home here in the UK. So... Good evening to you, particularly if you're taking a break from carnival celebrations to be with us here in London. So we've heard about the characters, the music and the creation of Fidelio. Our last guests to meet are the creative team behind this new production. Please welcome to join me here the director, Tobias Kratzer, set and costume designer, Rainer Zellmeyer, and video designer, Manuel Brown. Let's start with you, Tobias, yeah. and <laughs> Fidelio. Uh, first time? No, actually, I've done it once in Sweden and in Swedish. So I have some backstory with it, with the piece. <laughs> Was it a, an opera you, you yearned to do when you, were, when you were starting out? Somehow, yes, I have to say, because actually I think it's really a watershed piece in the entire history of the genre somehow. Um, I mean, as Tony was saying, um, and I think... Um, not only musically, but also um, dramaturgically, because I think it's really the first piece where one composer is not just trying to do a well-made piece of beautiful music, but is really taking the entire genre uh, to promote something like a higher goal, like a personal, very political mission. Um, and I think from then on, the entire medium of music theater became something very personal for a lot of composers. So there's a direct way leading from this to Verdi, to Wagner, to um, almost every contemporary composer, because except probably for the musical stage, but, um, um, uh, but in a way, uh, this is what, um, yeah, this is where it all started. Uh, and so also for a director, it's also always good to return to where it all started. Now, as our, as our singer said, as, our, uh, as Katie said, as Tony said, the point is you can see so much about life in Beethoven's time, but mm. life today as well. I mean, you could, you could set Fidelio in, mm. in half a dozen different political yes. scenarios for real now, couldn't you? Mm. Which, which I guess certainly has been a temptation for, mm -hmm. for many directors previously. Definitely it is. Um, for me, I think the first approach was more a formal one, and very often one, the formal approach leads to very um, important, uh, important um, goals and important uh, things in terms of content. Um, and I think the, the formal approach, or the, f the, the one fact that hasn't been mentioned yet, is that really the two halves of this opera, both acts, um, are very unequal somehow. And I don't know any opera where the acts are so unequal. Um, because the first act is really a, a completely psychological, emotional melodrama um, about love and um, lies in times of post-revolutionary times. Um, and then um, we only 
heard a little bit of the second act, but it takes um, on into completely different territory because the second act is much more, I sometimes call it on political essay in music somehow, um, because uh, the entire storyline that has been created and the entire fate of the character so far is now taking a much bigger dimension. And it's accentuated by a very, basically my favorite line from the entire piece, um, uh, from the duetto of Rocco and Leonore in the second act. Uh, from the outside, it's just a very simple and almost pragmatic scenery, even more pragmatic than the little uh, relationship fight at the beginning of the opera. The two are digging a hole in the ground. Um, and suddenly, while they are just singing about, oh, this rock is too hard to move and it's too heavy, please help me. So things you might not expect in an opera, at least not going on for two to three minutes, Beethoven uses this very, very everyday situation to suddenly open up a completely different world by one of Leonora's lines. Um, because suddenly she's singing about the man she has seen in the dungeon, and she has not recognized him 100% as her husband yet. And suddenly this duetto opens up to a very beautiful coloratura phrase by her, and she says, who, um, in German it is, wer du auch seist, ich will dich retten. Whoever you are, I will rescue you, I will save thee, if you put it into a bit more, uh, phrase it a bit more like in the Gospels. Um, and, um, and this is basically the moment when this entire uh, personal drama of her opens up to a much bigger question, because suddenly she becomes not only a woman um, searching for her husband, but really something like a symbol for empathy in general. So as you said to be right at the beginning, two very different mm -hmm. acts. Now, I don't know how much you want to give away here about this production, because uh, we don't, oh, want, we don't want spoilers, yet. do so. we? Uh, and we, we don't want people to, to, to kind of absolutely understand what mm. you're going to do. But you've done two very different things between the, the two acts. Exactly. So I really want to physically or, or also visually to make... Um, mm, uh, to follow the, the music here as closely as possible. So the first act, and I think we can already give this away, will be a very lavish, beautiful period piece um, that is set in post-revolutionary France. So people might expect the opera to be set in Spain, but um, as it has been pointed out here, I think this was just a thing that has been done due to the censorship. So whenever uh, an early 19th or late 18th century composer in middle Europe, uh, middle of Europe wanted to um, talk about his political circumstances, he just moved it to a more exotic place. And <laughs> so the closest exotic place um, for German or French composers was obviously France, so, which is also the reason why Mozart's Figaro, for example, um, is set in Spain rather than in France. Um, so we are sort of uh, returning what the censorship had uh, abolished from this piece so far. And then we come to the second act. Manuel, this is where your skills come to the fore. Are, are, are we in a, a specific place in the second act? Well, uh, when it comes to video, it has basically two functions in this. As Tobias said, it's like more a political essay. We don't have video in the first act, but we have it in the second act. It's quite more abstract, the whole setting. And it has basically do two ideas. It shows us that we are also like in the here and now world, that we are not stuck in the period world. It has aspects of it, but it's clearly a symbol that it's for all of us. It's now, it's present time. And it has the second function to show who is the society that allows injustice. It's like looking at people like me, looking at people like you, like all of us. Who are we that we allow things to happen? We see it daily on the streets, we see it on the news, but we still are sitting there. Some of us do more, someone is trying to help, others don't, and this is uh, what the video is showing. And there's an element of, of, of live video to this as well. We're not, we're not talking simply about pre No, it's, everything is live, yes. So it's kind of watching this, this, this way of watching someone on stage, watching the audience, which is always, which is always fascinating. Yes, it is, yeah. <laughs> That's, I think, all you're going to say. Well, yeah. well <laughs> we have to see on the show, but <laughs> that's basically like, as to be said, it's more like a political function of the video. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like to have it here and now and to have a look at the society on everyday people like me, like you, and why we don't do more against injustice. Reiner, will you come with me to this? To the costume. To the yeah. row of, of three, <laughs> three mannequins we have here with uh, costumes that yeah. we're going to see. Uh, and, and tell us a bit about them. Now, these are the costumes for Act One, or do that's the, the costumes... costumes... That's... No, for both. So this costume, you just see very few moments in the first act, so, so have a good look now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Leonora as a woman. It's Leonora as a woman, which is um, not planned in the, in, in, in the libretto, um, but we decided to um, just to show the audience that she is a woman and a period and um, um, more or less 
aristocratic woman so, um, um, to show where she comes from. So you see her in this dress, um, just um, sneaking into the prison and just finding out if this prison is worth to come back as a man and apply uh, for the job as a tailor. And it's really interesting because we can see, I mean, this is, this is expensive stuff, isn't it? This of is someone who has yeah, taste, yeah. Who, has, who has elegance, who has money. Yeah, yeah. it's made of um, pure silk, of course. And it's um, um, the fashion about um, um, 1790, so around the French Revolution. So it's, um, and um, also fashion-wise, um, this time is a um, period of change. So you can see the um, like similar dresses, just with a um, with the waistline um, raised or raised up, raised, with a, yeah. yeah, with a higher waistline, so that it looks more Regency, but also with more or less the same fabric and the, sa and the same appeal. So very very simple, very pure, but um, of course very precious. And of course you have to see the beautiful. <laughs> The, uh, a wonderful the, train. Um, yeah. Here all with, with hand-stitched um, um, uh, uh, pleats. And um, it's a shame that, um, yeah, you, you can see it um, for so, uh, so short. And of course, Leonore, because she is in trouble and she um, 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 in, a, in a hurry, so that way she moves around quite fast, well, and it, now you uh, can enjoy the beautiful It's very good that we have this opportunity, <laughs> I think, to show it off yeah, yeah. properly. Here she is yeah. uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Fidelio. No, 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 no. No. Because <laughs> um, her, um, um, cost, uh, her um, male costumes are in the dye um, department because the wool oh. uh, get broken down and patinated even more, and now they are quite damp and wet and so they have to dry overnight for tomorrow's um, rehearsal. So, so who is this? This is Rocco, so um, her boss. The jailer. Th um, the, the jailer, so it's, um, um, so I try to keep the costumes quite, quite simple, um, but still period, um, so, um, so that's more or less a contemporary um, three-piece suit, or you can see where it comes from. Of course, he has, um, um, Riches, wears so breeches, indeed. but I try to keep it very, very simple so that you just see, okay, it's a, some kind of um, and bookkeeper. Uh, very, very, very briefly, because yeah. we're running out of time, just, yeah, just, yeah, a, yeah. just a few seconds yeah. on, uh, on... That's uh, the villain on in black. <laughs> oh. and, of course, it, and of course in silk. <laughs> and with no patina at all, because he, he, he does not um, get any dirt on his... Um, yeah on his Teflon vest. Because he's a bad man. <laughs> let's, go and, let's go and join the other again. Thank you very much for that, uh, that fascinating introduction to the, to the costumes. <laughs> to be honest, it's, it, it's an opera that, that as I said, is, is, is very much of now, of, of today. Mm -hmm. And yet it sort of comes and goes from the, the repertoire. It's, it, it's always there, but mm -hmm. it's a piece perhaps we, we don't want to see too often. We want it to have this element of shock mm -hmm. and surprise each time we see it. Yay. Um, and I think um, it is exactly for these qualities that Manuel was pointing out. It has this very timeless quality. So to update it, you do not really have to update it on the surface. You have to just renew and reactivate the inner meaning of it. And this can be done in period or in a very um, almost symbolic um, abstract setting. I think it's uh, getting the energy um, of this piece does not require any actualizations on the surface. Mm. And here we are in the 250th anniversary of, 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 of Beethoven's birth and, and Manuel using the latest technology to bring, this, yes. to bring this piece to the stage. I think Beethoven would have loved it. I think we're just <laughs> pointing out his like, it's like with the music, it's kind of naked what we're doing in second act. It's very pure and it's about humanity, about freedom, about empathy. And I think Beethoven would have loved that. Mm. So, yes. Uh, will you come back to this again, Tobias, do you think? I mean, is this going to be a, a, an opera that you return to at various points in your career as a, as a director? Let's wait and see, maybe in 10 years. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> every decade uh, needs a new video, <laughs> video probably. <laughs> well, good luck with, uh, with this one. the yeah. first Let's night start on Sunday. With the first good luck with the next few days <laughs> of, uh, of rehearsals. Uh, and thank you all very much indeed thank for you. being yes. with us this evening. The creative team uh, behind uh, Fidelio here at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. Uh, director Tobias Kratzer, set and costume designer Rainer Zellmeyer and video designer Manuel Brown. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
John Morley is watching on YouTube this evening. Looking forward to seeing this, he says, a long time since we last had Fidelio at Covent Garden. And Vladimira Satanova, thanks for uh, your broadcast this evening. Best wishes to all involved in the production. We pass that on to our singers and uh, Antonio Papano as well. You can see Fidelio from here, the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden in London, live in cinemas around the world on March the 17th. Uh, that is it for our live broadcast this evening. Thank you very much for being with us wherever you're watching in the world. Thank you to our guests this evening, Jonas Kaufman, Lisa Davidson, Amanda Forsyth, Georg Zeppenfeldt, Katie Hamilton, Antonio Papano, Edmund Whitehead, Tobias Kratzer, Manuel Brown, and Reiner Zellmeyer. Uh, thank you to Rolex for their support. Thank you for watching. From all of us here at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, from London, good night. <laughs>